Dysphagia? Well, that's hard to swallow. Welcome to another episode of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam, and I've been living with multiple sclerosis for nearly 38 years. You may remember that in my last video, I casually mentioned difficulty swallowing and problems related to that. And wouldn't you know that within a few days, I got the latest issue of Brain and Life magazine, and they had an article about dysphagia. And I wanted to share that with you because one of the things I found very hopeful about it is that unlike many of the MS symptoms we have, we actually could learn to manage our difficulty with swallowing and improve it so that it's not making it hard for us to live our lives. One of the things that makes this article very timely is that it's now near the holiday season. And for many of us, we're going to be gathering with family and friends, which always involves food and festivities, right? And those are the kinds of times when we tend to have the most trouble if we're not careful because we're eating and we're talking and we're laughing and we're having a wonderful time. And the next thing you know, we're gagging on our food, we swallowed it wrong, it went down the wrong pipe. That's not something that we have to live with without any hope, and it doesn't even require strong drugs to take care of it. Isn't that great? When do you ever hear that when you're hearing about multiple sclerosis? Well, why don't we look at a couple of articles that I found that talk a little bit about that, including the Brain and Life article that I just finished reading, and we'll see what we can glean about this annoying and potentially even life-threatening symptom of difficulty swallowing. This is the article I talked about in the Brain and Life issue that just came out December, January of this year. On page 10, there's an article on healthy living that specifically talks about dysphagia. And they are, they're quoting Dr. David Buchholz, who is a neurologist in Lutherville Timonium, Maryland. Apparently, any neurologic disorder can have as one of its symptoms swallowing disorders, dysphagia. Common ones are stroke, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's, or multiple sclerosis. And as he talks about down a little further here, an estimated one in six adults in the United States has some difficulty swallowing, according to a survey conducted by Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And here are some of the causes or the conditions that might bring that on aging, gastroesophageal reflux, cancer of the head or neck, injury to or irritation of the esophagus can all make people susceptible to swallowing problems, and the risk is even higher if they have a neurologic condition. As we said earlier, and he specifically mentions stroke, where there's 65% of stroke survivors have swallowing problems, 50% of people with Parkinson's disease, 31% of people with multiple sclerosis, and a large percentage of people with dementia and motor neuron diseases, according to a June 2020 review in Neurological Sciences. And that's a significant number or a significant portion of the people who have multiple sclerosis, 31%. And I, yeah, I guess I'd be really curious to know, is this something that you have dealt with or are dealing with? Is it something that's pretty chronic for you or does it tend to come and go? I'd really be interested in comparing because for me, months and months can go by and I'll be fine and then all of a sudden something will happen. So definitely I do have trouble with lack of synchronization in my swallowing, but I would not describe it as a chronic condition. Here he talks about signs of dysphagia. They include drooling, food falling from the mouth or nose, slower chewing or swallowing, a feeling that food is sticking in the mouth or that the neck is full, pain when swallowing, coughing and throat clearing after swallowing, the voice sounding wet and gurgly during eating or drinking, and trouble coordinating and eating and breathing. 
Now, I've had some of those symptoms for sure, but not all of them. And I would say for me, it's mostly, again, lack of coordination in swallowing. So while there might be certain types of foods where I'm more prone to do that, it's not anything that I would have said is one of my top symptoms of MS. And so, as it says here, despite these symptoms, many people don't think to get help or inform their doctors that they have these problems. So I guess I'd fall into that many because I don't know that I ever actually have said anything to my doctor about it because it doesn't happen that often. And I don't think it's happened close enough to a doctor's appointment that I've had where I've thought, where I've kept it in mind and said, oh yeah, it's important. I really need to be sure I tell the doctor about this. So this is something to keep in mind for me and maybe for you as well if you haven't already talked to your doctor even your primary care provider just getting it on record that you have had this problem even if it's not a frequent problem or even if you recover quickly and it doesn't seem to be a real impairment it's just good for folks to know that when they're putting together a list of all of the symptoms that you have According to the article here, swallowing disorders are diagnosed through physical examinations and swallowing tests administered by speech-language pathologists. And it describes some of the different tests that can be used. They'll even put an endoscope down your throat to see what you actually do, what muscles are actually involved in your swallowing, so that if they can see a pattern, I guess that may help them figure out how to help you deal with your dysphagia. And it says here, for people with dysphagia, thin beverages like water, tea, and coffee can be difficult to swallow, as opposed to thicker be beverages. Like apricot nectar is one example that she gives. Or I would think maybe any kind of a smoothie or a milkshake something that's just thicker. So thin soups are harder than thicker soups. If you have a broth-based soup, it might be harder than a cream-based soup. One option that's offered here that I do really like because I use it myself is this idea of using a straw. When I think about the times that this has happened to me, it tends to be when I'm trying to drain the bottom of a glass of some liquid and I tip my head back. And that can sometimes trigger the in unsynchronized swallowing. So when I use a straw, that really does alleviate that problem. Elsewhere, they talk about the importance of sitting up straight. And I think that is something of the same thing. Position has a lot to do with whether you choke on your food or not. Finally, here at the end, they say you don't want to ignore swallowing problems since dysphagia can improve myth with treatment. And that's always good to know, right? Because so much of what we deal with in MS doesn't really lend itself to improvement. And, the, and again, they talk about sitting up straight, reducing distractions, and not talking while eating. And that, okay, that, you know, as I think about that, I've already talked about sitting up straight, but not talking while eating. This is very hard because so many of our social events and situations involve sharing a meal with family, friends, others. And of course, you're going to talk while you're sitting around the table. You're going to catch up with your friends. You're going to talk about the issues of the day. You're going to get involved in some kind of conversation. And the more in-depth the conversation is, the more likely you are to kind of not pay attention to your eating and the more likely you are to choke. And I have to say there have been a couple of times in social settings where I have had problems swallowing and probably I was focusing on the conversation and I wasn't focusing on what my actual swallowing was up to and you know it's 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 a ridiculous thing because don't you kind of feel like swallowing is almost an autonomous response <laughs> it would be much better if we didn't have to worry about it now over here on the sidebar they talk about the kinds of foods that you might want to try eating as opposed to the foods that you might avoid 
And here's something, here's some of the ones that they say. Vegetables that are boiled or steamed until soft, then finely chopped or mashed. Small pieces of fish or meat cooked until soft and topped with a thick, smooth gravy. Soft cooked and moist cereal without excess liquid. Minced or pureed fruit and smooth pureed foods that aren't sticky or lumpy. I haven't really tracked this incredibly well, so I'm sorry about that. But I do know that for me, milk and cereal, where there's a lot of extra liquid in the bottom after you finish the cereal, more problematic by far than if I just have a bowl of oatmeal with fruit or whatever, because that seems to be a, a, a consistency that I can handle pretty well. It, does, it doesn't have anything that's kind of itchy. I remember one time I choked on broccoli. It was cut into smallish pieces, but still, you know, the little leafy parts of broccoli, they can, they can kind of get caught in your throat. But drinking the milk in cereal when I'm all done with the cereal, that, it, that can be problematic. And problems can be solved if you use the milk as a creamer in your coffee or if you try to drink it in a different way. Don't, don't try to spoon it up. One of the things that's not easy for me is spoon by spoon of a thin liquid. So whether it's a broth or milk or something else that I'm just trying to spoon up and it's very, very liquid, the chances of my getting off sync with my swallowing are much greater because of that. And as they say here, here are the foods that they want you to avoid. Raw vegetables and apples, fibrous fruit like pineapple and the white part of the fruit, steak, dried fruit, fruit with a, food with a skin such as corn, grapes, and peas, shredded wheat, chicken with the skin on and hard, dry, chewy, crunchy, or crumbly food. I think, yeah, I think that's kind of intuitive. But if, if they do say here and elsewhere that you really need to look at your own situation. Just like so much with MS, there's no one size fits all here. No one food that you need to avoid or no one type of food that's best Try to track the kinds of things that cause you to choke on your food or to have swallowing difficulties. See if there is a certain kind of food that triggers that response in you and maybe just cut that out of your diet or try to eat it in a different form. You can always juice pineapple or whatever else is causing you difficulty. I hate to see you avoiding things like fruit because that's so good for you and we don't get enough fresh fruit as it is. So I would prefer that you try to just find a different form to eat it in, to, to blend it up or to do something different with it, maybe cook it down. I don't know. Be creative. Keep it in your repertoire because it's so healthy. So I went out online and I found some, um, a few articles on swallowing difficulties, specifically in multiple sclerosis. And I won't go through all of them, but I just going to pick out this one. All I could get on this one was the abstract for it because it, you have to pay if you want the whole thing. But I think I got what I needed just from the abstract. It's called Dysphagia in Multiple Sclerosis, Prevalence and Prognostic Factors. And this was a study out of, out of Italy in January of 2002. So it is not the newest thing, but it's surprising to me how unlike so much of the, the medical literature related to multiple sclerosis, what they seem to know about swallowing and its causes does not seem to have changed all that much in the 20 some years since this article was published. If we go down to the abstract here, I'll just I'll just read through this and comment as I run across things because I did see a few things in here that I thought really were relevant to me. It says that the aim of the study was to analyze swallowing function and to identify reliable prognostic factors associated with dysphagia in a consecutive series of patients with multiple sclerosis. 
Swallowing examination was performed by means of indirect and direct method, methods, fiberendoscopic evaluation, which I mentioned before, in 143 consecutive patients with primary and secondary progressive MS. And I just wanted to stop there for a second. I have had trouble with the unsynchronized swallowing back when I had relapsing MS. So I don't know why they limited it to just the, the progressive forms of MS. Maybe because it's more prevalent there, but I'm in secondary progressive now. And thankfully, I don't think that the incidence rate has increased for me or the severity. So perhaps it would have been in some ways a more reflective study had they included some folks with relapsing MS. But be that as it may, as they say here, dysphagia was found in 49 patients, which is 34.3%. And that is very close to the 31% that the previous article mentioned for people with multiple sclerosis. So one in three people essentially have dysphagia if they have MS. That's an interesting thing because I know quite a few people with multiple sclerosis and I can't honestly say that it's anywhere near the proportion or perhaps they're just not telling me. I don't know. It reminds me that maybe the next time I'm in my support group meeting, I'll bring it up and just make sure that maybe folks aren't reporting it just like the article before said. A close relationship with dysphagia, the article goes on to say, was found in the patients with severe brainstem impairment as compared to the patients without. Well, I don't know whether my brainstem impairment is severe, honestly, but I remember years and years ago, an MS doctor that I was talking with was talking to me about the kinds of symptoms that I had, which included balance for one thing and dizziness. And he was saying that a lot of those symptoms related to the brainstem. So he said, it's the chances are good that you do have lesions in your brainstem. And that was so long ago. That was back in the, I don't know, early nineties, late eighties, something like that. Interesting that the science really hasn't changed all that much, or at least the prevailing theory of what part of your brain is affected. So that is very interesting to me, given the great strides and changes we've seen in MS in general along the way. And then finally here they say, compensatory strategies were sufficient to resolve the dysphagia in 46 cases, that is 93.8%. Well, that's the vast majority, so take heart. If you have swallowing difficulties, there might be help for you. The potential risk of aspiration, which means, as my mother used to say, having your food go down the wrong pipe, and malnutrition, and the high efficacy of swallowing rehabilitation suggests that all MS patients should have a careful evaluation of deglutition functionality, especially those with brainstem impairment and a high grade of disability level. So if that sounds at all familiar to you, I guess that's something that you want to be sure that you talk with your doctor about. But perhaps to catch it when it's really not that big of a problem would be better. If there are ways that we could learn how to handle our swallowing a little bit better, then why don't we do that? Now we've been talking an awful lot about brainstem and I went out to the Cleveland Clinic website just to find out just a little bit more about the brainstem. And I'll put up a photo here so, or a diagram here so you can see what a brainstem looks like and where it is relative to the rest of your brain. It says here that your brainstem is the bottom stalk-like portion of your brain. It connects your brain to your spinal cord. Your brain stem sends messages to the rest of your body to regulate balance, breathing, heart rate, and more. So as you can see, most of that is fairly autonomous. You don't really have to think about it at all. In fact, it's hard to control some of that stuff voluntarily if you really want to. Some people can get their heart rate to go faster and slower, but for the most part, it's autonomous, and so is breathing, really. According to the doctor that I talked to many years ago, he pretty much said that sudden injuries and brain or heart conditions may affect 
how your brain stem works. Somewhat of a repeat of what they just said, but they said that the brain stem regulates some body functions, including your brain, your breathing and heart rate, and also your balance, coordination, and reflexes. Now that's a new one. They didn't really talk about coordination and reflexes earlier, but I could perhaps see why someone with multiple sclerosis who's having brainstem issues might indeed have these kinds of problems. It makes sense when you think that your reflexes are hyperactive, like your leg when they hit you with the hammer. So isn't it sensible that you would also have hyperactive reflexes when it comes to swallowing? When you start to choke, you just can't stop. And here, here's another list, similar to what I've already said, but it looks like, again, they've included a couple extra things. We talked about balance. Blood pressure, that's a new one that had not been addressed before. Breathing, yes. Facial sensations, well, that's a new one. Hearing, okay. Heart rhythms and swallowing. So all of those together are a list, or at least a partial list of what we use the brainstem for what what good it does i've noticed that it's very hard for scientists to map the brain as far as where what parts of the brain control specific functions or memories or the five senses or anything but it does seem that the brainstem is better understood from that perspective than some parts of the brain are it says that your brainstem also contains 10 of the 12 cranial nerves, the nerves that start in your brain, and these nerves control your facial movement sensations and taste. Well, that certainly makes sense. There was a time years and years ago, my, I was still in relapsing MS and probably pretty early on. For a few weeks, I my sense of taste was really off. I couldn't eat most foods and really enjoy eating them. Some things tasted like blood, to be honest. But the only thing I am ever living on for a long time was potato pancakes with applesauce. That tasted pretty normal, but most everything else tasted pretty wretched. So I don't know, is that something that you've ever dealt with? But now I see that once again, that was a brainstem problem, and it makes sense. And then as far as keeping your brain stem healthy, there's no magic bullet here. I think brain health in general is what they're saying here is important. And the, the list of items that they give are things that I've heard many times just for general brain health. Things like drinking alcohol only in moderation, eating a diet full of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, healthy fats, lean protein, regular exercise, and practicing puzzles such as crosswords, jigsaw puzzles, or word searches to keep your brain active, and then sleeping at least seven to eight hours at night. Finally, quit smoking. I would say that this list is probably good for general health and longevity, wouldn't you? And then finally, they also say that a strong social network has also been linked with brain health, because healthy relationships can help lower your blood pressure, decrease stress, and increase your lifespan. Of course, we were just talking earlier about how social situations are the time when you get so engaged in the talking and the conversation and the fun that you sort of forget to swallow properly. So you're going to have to just be more mindful, I guess. Well, there you go. There's what we know about difficulty swallowing, dysphagia. It's got a long history of being known about and associated with neurological disorders. But the interesting thing to me is that the treatments haven't really changed all that much from way back in the day when I first talked about my about the brainstem and what it does when I met with my doctor years and years ago. So I don't know. I'm not uh, I'm not able to really give you a Christmas present per se, but this might be as close as a Christmas present as you can get. Something that's related to MS that can actually be fixed. So if you haven't already talked to your primary care doctor or your neurologist, you might want to. And in the meantime, please do let me know if this condition is something that you deal with 
and how you have learned to manage it in your own life. And of course, I really want you to take good care of yourself. I'll see you again in my next video, which is probably going to be next year in 2023.